This is Ross William Ulbricht. On the 1st of October 2013, he was arrested in the science fiction section of this public library here in San Francisco. And this is Dread Pirate Roberts, the mastermind of Silk Road, an underground eBay of vice selling drugs and guns. Total global revenues were over a billion dollars. The US federal government alleges that Ross Ulbricht is the man who set up and operated Silk Road behind the pseudonym Dread Pirate Roberts. But is Ulbricht simply the victim of mistaken identity, or indeed the kingpin in one of the biggest cybercrime stories in history? Ross Ulbricht is currently in this jail behind me awaiting trial, having pled not guilty on charges of drug trafficking, money laundering and criminal enterprise. But it's also alleged that he's done something much worse, arranged the murder of one of his associates. As a technologist, I'm fascinated by every aspect of online behavior. How we have adapted to this brave new world in such a short space of time is miraculous. Criminals have adapted too. We call their devious work cybercrime. Within a decade, we'll just call it crime. In this episode, I'll be looking at the impact of alter egos, dark nets, and online cryptocurrencies on the modern world. Is this the long-sought utopia of a removal of physical limitations? Or is it a Dorian Gray-like parable of moral decay in the mirror world? In our daily lives, we all wear different masks. Who we are to our parents is perhaps not the same person our friends, work colleagues and lovers see. The same is true on the web. We can all have aliases, pseudonyms that allow both freedom of expression and supposedly actions without consequences. There are things that people will say online to other people that they wouldn't say if they could actually stare into the person's eyes. There is some different sense of reality and some different sense of a lack of consequences and you have to think what on earth was this person thinking and it clearly was that the, the, there was some lack of a sense of propriety coming from perhaps the, the physical disconnection coming from perhaps the fact that it was being typed rather than spoken meet ross albright six foot two raised in Austin, Texas with a loving, law-abiding family, an Eagle Scout and a third-grade math champion who grew into an extremely bright, handsome young man. Ulbricht ended up moving from his native Texas to live and work in San Francisco, the global capital of e-commerce. But who was he online? Reportedly, this is the cafe that Ross Ulbricht spent much of his time in whilst he was working here. And indeed, reportedly, this is the very table that he worked from. Now online, I have here his LinkedIn page. LinkedIn is the site where we show our professional reputation. And really, he looks really good. He's got a whole load of publications here of working on solar power, and he's listing his education at two really good degrees. He's clearly a man of, of great heart and also strong ideas. I want to use economic theory as a means to abolish the use of coercion and aggression amongst mankind. His last listed job is as CEO at Good Wagon Books, which appears to be a charitable organization that does a lot of good work in the community with secondhand books and, and objects. But Good Wagon Books came to a dramatic end in 2011, when the warehouse shelves collapsed. He apparently saw this as a sign to move on, but on to what? Did Ulbricht go from trading in books to trading in drugs? The FBI will rely on the following evidence. 
On the 23rd of January 2011, a WordPress blog is published directing people to a hidden site selling marijuana, shrooms, and MDMA. According to the FBI, four days later, a user calling himself Altoid advertises Silk Road on a forum devoted to magic mushrooms. I came across this website called Silk Road. It's a tour hidden service that claims to allow you to buy and sell anything online anonymously. Let me know what you think. Two days later, Altoid posts again on the forum Bitcoin Talk. So here we go, first Bitcoin drugstore. With such minimal fanfare, the Silk Road takes off. In June, early members Digital Alk, Nomad Bloodbath and Chronic Pain are enlisted as moderators, while vendors with names like Lucy Juicy, Tetravort, Mile High Medicine and Tony76 sell a cornucopia of drugs to thousands of buyers. Bitcoins, a digital currency, are held in trust by Silk Road until the drugs are delivered via the postal system. But for over a year, the founder of the site is still without a name. I am Silk Road, the market, the person, the enterprise, everything. But Silk Road has matured and I need an identity separate from the site and the enterprise of which I am now only a part. Note, identity, not name or alias or alter ego or pseudonym, but identity. Now studying his posts, you realize how good he is if he is a he, at drumming up support. He takes his role really seriously. The founder is literate, he's lyrical, he's witty, and maybe just a tad messianic. At 4.48 a.m. on the 5th of February 2012, he announces, drum roll please, and my new name is Dread Pirate Roberts. I know who you are. Your cruelty reveals everything. You're the Dread Pirate Roberts. Admit it. With pride. Taken from the 1987 fantasy film The Princess Bride, the name is itself a pseudonym, designed to be handed down from one retiring pirate to the next to instill fear. Actually, in the film, the character Dread Pirate Roberts turns out to be a romantic good guy. And Ross Ulbricht, according to those who know him personally, seems an unlikely criminal mastermind. We know that Ross is the friend who always shows up. The friend you call when your car breaks down, or when you need help moving, or when you just need help. Ross is the friend you trust because he gives you his honest opinion, even when it's difficult to hear. Ross is the friend you can tell anything to because he always listens and never judges. We know who Ross is. He's the son who makes time for his family, and the brother who moves across the world to be close to his sister. Albrecht categorically denies all charges. Perhaps whoever decided to assume the identity of Dread Pirate Roberts, they were enacting an online fantasy role. That person saw themselves as a force for good, a libertarian, even romantic champion to thousands of embattled drug users, serving and protecting them from interference by the state. With global revenues of over a billion dollars, the scale of the Silk Road operation was vast. An academic study in 2012 found over 500 individual sellers listing nearly 25,000 unique items for sale. It was dubbed the eBay of Vice for good reason. And according to the prosecution, Dread Pirate Roberts reaped commissions worth tens of millions of dollars. So, how was Silk Road able to last so long? The answer lies in the most unlikely of places. The US government. If this site had been on the regular internet, the one we know and love, it would have been shut down within days, if not hours. But Dread Pirate Roberts was smart. He launched it on the hidden internet, the one colloquially known as the dark web or dark net. Ironically enough, that was invented by the US government, although they prefer to call it the onion router, or Tor. Tor allows for online anonymity, protecting your privacy and effectively stopping everyone from the US National Security Agency to Amazon and Google from accessing your data. 
So how and why did Tor come about? In 1995, at the US Naval Research Lab, a 30-year-old mathematician was pondering how government intelligence workers, spies to you and me, could protect their identities online. This is actually just my colleagues and I around the office thinking, well, how could we do this? Um, how you could get bits from A to B and have them get where they needed to go without anybody except the communicants knowing uh, where they were ultimately coming from and going to. It just sort of evolved as we stood in front of the chalkboard talking and working and thinking it through. This breakthrough invention by Paul Syverson and his team led to what is now Tor, a powerful tool that stops others from tracking our online activities. It has advantages for us all, not just for criminals. Can we say that it's better for society than more people using Tor? To the extent that it's better to have more secure communications, it's better for society. So you'd encourage everybody to use it? I would encourage everybody to use it, yes. As much as, uh, as much as they can. The privacy and security that Tor potentially offers us all also has a downside. The users of illegal sites such as Silk Road use the cloak of anonymity to hide from the law. But is this a price worth paying? This isn't mustard gas we're talking about. This is a way of protecting you so you can speak freely if you're in a repressive regime, or you just want to um, uh, hide yourself from your abusive ex-spouse. Um, Tor is a tool that's used every day by dissidents all around the world. It's also used to hide the Silk Road's website. Rather than seeing this new medium as being a place where criminals go, you realize that this is a place like another town or a mall where criminal things happen and you use the tools of that space to catch those criminals. And for Dread Pirate Roberts, the apparent anonymity that Tor afforded the Silk Road would prove his undoing. For a character taken from a children's fantasy film, Roberts was soon to show his teeth. A previously trusted lieutenant was accused of stealing and then condemned to die. The question is, was the person behind the persona suddenly and irretrievably out of his depth? The stakes were high. Dread Pirate Roberts was now running a big business, allegedly generating vast profits through commissions. However, Silk Road didn't use dollars, pounds or euros. It traded exclusively in a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. Invented by an elusive character called Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, Bitcoin is the first decentralized digital currency or cryptocurrency. It can be securely transferred directly person to person over the net without going through a bank. Importantly, unlike traditional currency, Bitcoin is not linked to or issued by any central authority such as a government. Currency exchanges now exist where you can buy and sell bitcoins for pounds, dollars, yen and more. And bitcoins are kept in your own encrypted digital wallet on your computer or mobile device. And today, you can use them to buy almost anything, from a ticket to a future flight in space, to clothes or a meal. In May 2010, Laszlo Hanyecz was believed to have made the first ever Bitcoin purchase. Via a forum member in the UK, he exchanged 10,000 Bitcoins for two pizzas at $25. The value of Bitcoins, despite boom and bust, has increased significantly. Today, the Bitcoins spent on those pizzas are worth millions of dollars. Now, there is one thing that complicates this, and that's human nature. Are the people who are into Bitcoin the victims of FOMO or the fear of missing out? Or should you be looking for your own slice of pie? If, say, you wanted to wash down your pizza with a cold beer, there are now many establishments, including bars, where you can spend your digital currency. Would you like a glass, sir? 
No, that's fine. Thank okay. you very much. This is a bar that accepts Bitcoin. How would one go about um, buying this beer with, with Bitcoin? It would be the same as if you were using a credit card. You could open a tab or pay per round. Hey, can I settle my tie with you? For sure, buddy. You take Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most likely you'd pull out your phone, I'd pull out our point of sale device, and we would just do the transaction right there instantly. How about $8? It's very simple. I would say it's simpler than using a credit card, really. And that's it. It's a shame that Bitcoin was tainted from the beginning with Silk Road and the deep web or whatever they call it, money laundering schemes. If you're going to do something illegal, it's best to pay with dollars. <laughs> pay with dollars for all your illegal activity and save Bitcoin. This is a new way of sending money instantly across the world. So you don't want to ban the technology. You want to understand how this technology fits in, how it can be misused, and how you can stop the misuse while accentuating the, the positive. And sooner or later, you know, you'll be able to pay your taxes in Bitcoin, and Bitcoin will become a, a part of, of our everyday lives. But the use of Bitcoin on so-called dark markets such as Silk Road continues to blight the currency's reputation. And for the ultra-modern online drug dealer, things were getting a bit old school. The FBI was watching right from the start, waiting for Dread Pirate Roberts to make a mistake. On January the 7th, 2013, Curtis Clark Green, AKA Silk Road moderator Chronic Pain, is arrested after a kilo of cocaine is intercepted in the mail. The US government alleges that Dread Pirate Roberts believes his once trusted lieutenant has stolen $350,000 worth of bitcoins. Between the 26th and 29th of January, Dread Pirate Roberts negotiates the price of killing chronic pain with an unknown Silk Road user. He agrees to a fee of $80,000 half up front and half on completion. 11th of February, chronic pain disappears from the Silk Road. 21st of February, Dread Pirate Roberts has sent a picture showing Curtis Clark Green's dead body. The assassination was pure fantasy. Chronic Payne had become an FBI informant in return for a reduced sentence, and Dread Pirate Roberts had been corresponding with an undercover agent all along. Roberts had fallen for a classic FBI sting, helped and ultimately undone by the very pseudonymity that had been the Silk Road's secret of success. This is one of the indictments from the state of Maryland against Ross Ulbricht. It shows the correspondence between the online identity, Dread Pirate Roberts, and the undercover agent. You could argue that this is entrapment, except the indictment alleges it's Dread Pirate Roberts himself that first suggests murdering chronic pain. Here, Roberts admits, I'm new to this kind of thing. And then later on, he says, I'm pissed I had to kill him, but what's done is done. I just can't believe he was so stupid. I just wish more people had some integrity. Well, whoever it is who lies behind these comments, I want to know if the pseudonymity is responsible for the transformation into a cold and calculating killer was whoever it was that was playing Dread Pirate Roberts actually being changed by the role that they were playing. For every person like Dread Pirate Roberts, of course, you have a million people who perhaps push at the boundaries but don't do anything illegal. In general, people are given to sort of looking at what role am I playing? And if it's easy, and if the internet makes it easier to take on a role like this that someone wouldn't happen into unless they were existing in a milieu of organized crime to begin with, then perhaps they can get sucked into playing the part that they've seen on television, that they've seen on the internet, that they've seen, that they've seen in their heads. And inside the head of whoever was playing Dread Pirate Roberts, it appears that transition had already taken place. After all, who can you trust when everyone is playing a role and no one is using their real name? As Roberts tries to exert control on his site, prosecutors allege he arranged a further five murders. The combination of Tor and Bitcoin clearly gave Dread Pirate Roberts a sense of security. But despite this double cloak of secrecy, law enforcement was closing in. 
1st of June 2011, Gorka.com blows Silk Road's cover. Republican Senator Chuck Schumer calls Silk Road the most brazen attempt to peddle drugs online that we have ever seen. In response, a multi-agency task force is set up in Baltimore. Operation Marco Polo. Undercover agents begin to make transactions on Silk Road. 11th of October 2011. A user called Altoid posts on Bitcoin Talk, apparently looking for an IT professional for a Bitcoin startup. He gives the email address rossulbricht at gmail.com. Federal authorities allege that this is the same Altoid who first advertised Silk Road back in January. They also connect Ross Ulbricht's email address with the real Ross Ulbricht. Added to this evidence, fake IDs with Ross Ulbricht's likeness had been intercepted at the Canadian border. While around the same time online, the Dread Pirate Roberts had requested phony licenses from a Silk Road vendor. Law enforcement alleges that this was no coincidence. But it gets worse. When he was living here on this quiet San Francisco street in 2013, he was known to his flatmates as Josh Terry. Now, why would he need an alias in real life? In August 2013, Forbes magazine published an interview with Dread Pirate Roberts. Roberts mocks the US government's war on drugs, boasting that we've won the state's war on drugs because of Bitcoin. This reads now like the ultimate act of hubris. The multi-agency task force, Marco Polo, was on to Dread Pirate Roberts and ready to close down Silk Road. Fourteen people would be arrested worldwide as a result of Operation Marco Polo. But it was here in a public library in this very relaxed part of a very laid-back city that was the focal point of the operation. The key piece of evidence was Ulbricht's laptop. But the FBI knew that if he was to close that laptop, it would go to sleep and encrypt all of the data on it. And so, sat at his table here at the public library, he was be approached by a young woman. I'm so sick of you, she would scream. And as he reels back in shock, she grabs the laptop, keeping it open. The surrounding patrons rip off their jackets and reveal themselves to be FBI undercover agents. After the arrest, the feds released screenshots of the laptop. They alleged that he was on the admin page of Silk Road at the time of the bust, as well as operating an avatar with the name Dread Pirate Roberts. The FBI say they seized 144,335 bitcoins from Ulbricht's computer hardware, tens of millions of dollars worth. And they went public with their allegation that Dread Pirate Roberts had tried to commission murder. If true, all Roberts philosophizing about libertarian freedom, of standing up for our rights against state interference, was instantly rendered meaningless. I think one of the biggest shocks for a lot of people who use the Silk Road is they had a, quite a romantic idea of the Dread Pirate Roberts, right? And so when the details came out of the investigation, this really transformed their, their, their view uh, of what they were taking part of. Dread Pirate Roberts, the good guy from The Princess Bride, you know, he betrayed the good name of Dread Pirate Roberts when he started going down this dark road. <laughs> But what of the real-life person, Ross Ulbricht, who the authorities allege was behind Silk Road? People were led to believe that Ross, who is the most peaceful, non-violent, positive, compassionate person I've ever met, would, could be capable of murder and torture and talking like a character in a bad cop show, frankly, which Ross has never talked about that way in his life. And, um, you know, I don't know who that person was or if they even exist, but it wasn't Ross. Ross Ulbricht denies all the charges against him. And if true, we still are no wiser as to who was behind the actions of Dread Pirate Roberts. It's thanks to pseudonymity that we know that those murders weren't real. But pseudonymity is also to blame for the mistrust in the first place. In 2014, a physical human will stand trial on charges levied against an online identity. And only time will tell if that real human will face a sentence 
that is very long and very real.